Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to this online seminar of the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at the George Washington University. My name is Marlene Lauren. I'm the director of the Institute, and I'm delighted to receive uh, here today uh, uh, four of our uh, uh, dear colleagues who will be discussing what is going on in Lachin today. As you know, the situation in the uh, uh, Lachin corridor has been really uh, uh, getting uh, worse since uh, uh, December. And so today we have a great panel of experts to discuss what is going on in the Lachin corridor, <clears throat> who is responsible for the crisis, what is Russia uh, and Western Europe are doing, what are the interests of Turkey and Iran, <clears throat> uh, uh, what is happening on the Azerbaijani and the, the Armenian side. And it's a really uh, a great combination of uh, scholars here. So I wanted to take uh, Mikhail Mamedov for launching that, that event and, and uh, uh, proposing it to us. Let me say a few words about who is joining us today. So we have with us uh, Ahmad Alili, who is a researcher in international public policy and regional security in the South uh, 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 Caucasus. He's the director of the Caucasus Policy and Analysis Center, a Baku-based independent think, think tanks intending to achieve regional integration in the South Caucasus, and is also a lecturer at the Academy of Public Administration in, in Baku. We also have with us Anne Phillips, who is a scholar practitioner with a long experience as a professor in US and German universities. She was a senior political economist at USID, a senior policy analyst at the US Department of State, and more recently, she was a senior advisor to the Nagorno-Karabakh South Caucasus project at the U.S. Institute of, of uh, Peace. So really, uh, we are delighted to have you with us, uh, uh, Anne. And we have with us also Alexander Iskandarian, a dear friend of the Institute, uh, a political scientist, director of the Caucasus Institute in Yerevan, and also a member of our uh, PONARS uh, network uh, working on Armenia and the South Caucasus. And our moderator today is Mikhail Mamedov, who has his PhD from Georgetown University, where he's also a lecturer in history and the liberal studies program. He's from a multi-ethnic Azeri-Armenian uh, 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 background, and he has been uh, uh, the author of numerous articles on the history of the Caucasus and the, the, the Karabakh conflict. So it's a really great group to have with us today. Thank you so much for making it. And then Mikael, I will give you the floor so you can lead a kind of a, a, a open discussion with our three speakers. Okay, thank you so much, Madeline. Okay, let's start. I would like to ask everyone, well, maybe I will, let's start with Ahmad. What do, and then we will go to everybody else. Uh, what do you think? What is going on in Latin? Because most of the people, most of the experts, journalists, and uh, uh, analysts, they blame Baku for what is going on. What is in your opinion? Well, they blame Russia, they blame uh, Baku, and then well, very few of them blame Armenian side. So what, in your opinion, is going on in Azerbaijan? Would you agree with it? Uh, we are not in blame business. We are not going to blame anyone. We are going to look to the root causes of it. We are going to look uh, the concerns of the sides. What led to this uh, to this issue? So I would say that uh, yes, the Azerbaijan concerns in this case play the key role. And the Azerbaijan concerns are that that uh, it is one of the again, as I mentioned last time in the last meetings, this is a, one of the biggest peace building and the confidence building measures, the Lachin corridor, like it was, it was like the Azerbaijan telling that, look, I'm totally okay with the Karabakh Armenians having a special connection with the uh, Armenian Armenians and uh, exploiting and uh, allowing them a chance to exploit this connection for their uh, greater good. But once that corridor, that humanitarian corridor was started using for non-humanitarian purposes, uh, when Azerbaijan side uh, claimed that there is a, a, a landmine transportation through that humanitarian corridor, there is uh, uh, the, uh, the weapons transportation, there are soldiers are being transported through humanitarian corridor. That concerns that made Baku much more, let's say, active in this direction. So that is why, yes, the certain impetus came from there. So this is another question like uh, why um, this continues this long, the whole process, what's happening on, uh, on Lachin Road continues this, this long. 
um, um, like the, who is who should take the responsibility for that? Apparently, all the fingers are pointed to um, to to uh, Russia in this case, and I believe that Russia has its own reasons why it's not that active, why it doesn't want to move on and uh, take, uh, let's say, uh, do what it is expected from Russia to do. And uh, frankly speaking, I believe that there is uh, like the um, the main reason, as in, in, in the last time we explained to you, uh, to, to our group of the, uh, the, the, the people in our last meeting, that once Russia is cut off from its uh, economic connections from European Union and the United States, the main region that Russia wants to increase its influence, it's Middle East. Middle East is a quite important, became quite important for Russia. It wants to increase its potential there. So that is why it desperately needs some uh, land route connections with the region. So in that sense, its dependence uh, on Azerbaijan, Russia's dependence on Azerbaijan increased uh, like to like the it's it's really high. But at the same time, Russia does not want to lose uh, Armenians. I'm not saying Russia doesn't want to lose Armenia. I frankly speaking, I believe that the links between Armenia and uh, Russia is quite strong, and I don't believe that it's easily can be um, uh, broken. But that that the Russia can lose Armenians, and I believe that still there is a quite a big uh, diaspora in the Middle East. There's a quite a still big diaspora in the parts of the world, and uh, I believe that with the existing with the when that there is uh, not many friends around the world for Russia, Russia wants to use as many resources as it can. So in this con uh, in this context, that resources by Armenian diaspora can be quite valuable. So that's why Russia is like the, in, a, the, in, a, in this uh, situation where it cannot uh, choose a side. It's, it's like the, uh, keeps uh, the balance there. And the reason why it happens, also yeah. there is one important factor that um, Russia, it's kind of it's uh, going to be test for Ar the Armenian diaspora and the Russia staying still, allowing the Armenian diaspora in Europe, in the United States, to use it is uh, resources to put a maximum pressure on Azerbaijan. So it's going to be a test. Well, like the, on, uh, for Russia, I'm very unhappy with Russian Russian inaction. And exactly, uh, but. And also, so, so why that's the thing. People, these people always call themselves eco activists. They are not part of. Yes. They are not even Greenpeace, who could be very no, right. They are not. Be, well, might be sometimes they could be like actually as ext extremists, right? They are not. Uh, uh, they, sorry. Why, why they always speak about the danger of environment? I understand when they spoke about smuggling, putting, uh, bringing weapon. Oh, sometimes they point finger at Ruben Vardanyan, but why they speak about uh, uh, threat of environment to Karabakh? Why they say ecocide? Oh, why speak about ecocide? I saw recent pictures oh. of uh, with other young people who were holding posts ecocide. Stop I ecocide. Can... Let's call it a movement on, 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 uh, on Latin Road. That movement changed quite a lot. The very first demand, when the very first, uh, uh, the very first, the very first hours, when the door, the, when the, the the corridor was closed, it was the very first demands were that we want Volkov, so General Volkov. They demanded presence of General Volkov. Now, after all of this time, like the, the demand, they transformed immediate uh, to 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 the extent that that nobody remembers even the very first demands, frankly speaking. So that's yeah. why now the very first the very first demands again like the the very first demand was that Wolf, Volkov promised something General Volkov Russian general who promised like that the mini checkpoint and the Azerbaijan is being able to control the uh, mines okay. there yeah. and the, that was the very first demand but many people forget about that so all this time yeah, so many time elements enough. emerge so. So, so that is why, like, the, saying that why there is a, a echo uh, demands and the arms demand, etc. Now there is a so so many demands. The demand, the number of demands increased to the quite a lot. Yes, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Ahmed and uh, mm -hmm. Alexander. So, what is, in your opinion, then we will go to and uh, what is going on in Latin, in your opinion? Why is there so many? And do, do, why is there so? Why is this? 
why is these people just vlogging? It's almost two months. Uh, this this thing is going on for two months almost. In oh, six days, it will be two months. Okay, what's going on? Uh, it's a type of pressure. Uh, and what is the what is the goal of Azerbaijan? If you can, put this I will try to I will try yes. to explain my my uh, understanding of that. Uh, Azerbaijan pressed on uh, both Armenians of Republic of, uh, of Armenia, Armenians of uh, NK, with different formats. Uh, I would say that the first format uh, is a discursive format. Uh, Azerbaijani officials, and not just officials, and president of Azerbaijan of the year included, say that uh, Karabakh a problem uh, was resolved, Karabakh is not exist, they don't have, uh, already you, you by, by some reasons you cannot say Nagorno, you should mean it Karabakh economic region. So Karabakh is not exist, people are not there, there are just you know, several a uh, couple of dozens of thousands of medias. I, I, I mean, discourse. And Azerbaijanis are going to come back to, to Yerevan, to, to Sunik, to, to uh, Sevan. Uh, they, these are regions of Republic of Armenia, not uh, of Nagorno Karabakh, etc. So you have discursive pressure. Second is diplomatic types of. Uh, pressing. Uh, Azerbaijan doesn't have uh, diplomatic relationships with Armenia, so they can do it from, for, through for third countries like Turkey, like Russia, like Western countries, uh, uh, etc., to try to press in Armenia uh, diplomatically and politically. Then uh, third type of pressure is uh, on the ground, escalations. Uh, Roughly speaking, shooting. Last uh, uh, big escalation we had in September, just from Armenian side, more than 200 uh, people died. And they bombed, not, it, it was a, not on the border of uh, Karabakh uh, and, uh, or line Karabakh and Azerbaijan, but the border of uh, Azerbaijan and Republic of Armenia. Uh, before that, it was in August, before that, in March, etc. So the military type of pressure. And fourth is this uh, blockade. So uh, why do they do it? Because they can, uh, because uh, there is an opportunity. Russia is, I would say, busy uh, in Ukraine and Russian interest is concentrated now on situation uh, in Ukraine and around Ukraine, South Caucasus is not the center of their activities now. Activities, I mean, both technical uh, uh, and political. Uh, Russians, I, I absolutely agree with uh, with uh, Ahmed. They need Azerbaijan uh, and they need Turkey, which is maybe more important than Azerbaijan. Uh, because, you know, the... the West uh, border of Russia with Europe is, is closed, generally speaking. Uh, Ukraine is clear that Belarus, which is under san sanction, then Baltic states, they are members of uh, of NATO, then Finland, then Norway. So, so all, all it is is closed. Closed, not just as communication, closed economically, politically, etc. Uh, China, that Central Asia is far away, it's it's different region. So only, only corridor or, or, I don't know, communication through Russia and West could be through South Caucasus. This is about Turkey and uh, Azerbaijan. It's about- but Is uh, Azerbaijan trying to force all Armenians out of uh, Karabakh or is it trying to re uh, achieve- Yes, some Azerbaijan is general goal. I they go to corridor. Ali, Ali have said it. Aliyev said it. He said that if uh, some people from Artsakh would like to leave uh, Artsakh, uh, Artsakh, sorry, Artsakh is uh, Armenian name for Nagorno Karabakh. They uh, would like to leave uh, NK forever, so they will do it. And ecological activists will let them uh, go out of of, of this uh, of NK. 
so yeah, the general goal is, is that. But now uh, the goal is checkpoint. Mm -hmm. Checkpoint uh, between Armenia and nagorno -Karabakh. You know well, that it's only road. You it's only road. This uh, environmental activists, so call, you call them, I mean, they, they are not environmental activists, they've never been. It doesn't question. matter. People, yes. it's not the uh, Jure. They uh, legally, they are not, it, it's not checkpoint legally. Yeah. But de facto, it is because uh, they are there and you cannot go here or there without their permission. So this is uh, a goal to have control of. Uh, control on, on this road and having control of that, you control the Gorda Karabakh uh, as a whole. For example, now I you asked me what was going on today, just a couple of hours uh, ago, they said that uh, it, it was an information uh, that they opened a gas pipe, possibility to... to uh, gas pipeline from from Armenia to Nagorno Karabakh. So they will have heating. They did it, if I'm not mistaken, five or six times already. So uh, electricity is more or less the same. Uh, in Karabakh, the inside they can produce electricity, but not so much. So it's not enough. So they have okay. some electricity several hours a, a day. So uh, one of the scenarios is just pushing. People out of Karabakh. On, on people. Okay. And second scenario, second, uh, some analysts in Armenia, things like that, that uh, in some moment they can open uh, open the road. And in that moment, uh, an amount, maybe a big amount of population of the Nagorno Karabakh will decide to go out after all this. Yeah. So okay. more or less they do it because, because they. Because they can. Thank okay, you. thank you so much. Okay, and, and what in your opinion is going on in the region? How is it seen from the US? You are in, in you are here, you're somewhere in this area, in Washington, this area, Washington metropolitan area. I think you are muted. You are muted. I'm I'm now should be okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, I muted right. myself just for not to interfere with the others. Um yes, I'm in Washington, DC. I, I mean, I, I um, like my colleagues, I view the Latin corridor crisis in a larger context um, and see this very fluid environment and a new geostrategic landscape in the region following the Second Karabakh War. That's obvious. Um, and I think it's important to remind ourselves that the Second Karabakh War demonstrated the failure of diplomacy demonstrated the failure of multilateral institutions, the OSCE Minsk group in particular, and parallels a broader global trend toward remilitarization of international relations. Um, so, and I would just uh, to remind ourselves, the Lachin corridor crisis didn't begin in December. We recall that already clashes broke out in August of 2022. Um, Azerbaijan had completed its construction of its section of the road well ahead of schedule. The Armenians, from Baku's perspective, seemed to be dragging their feet and didn't actually start their section until after the first clashes, although that was still well within the time frame set out through the truce agreement. Um, and I think the Lachin Corridor uh, blockade, I see it I'm not presenting a Washington perspective, but I see it as also linked to the ongoing problems with the Southern transit route, which is extremely important uh, to both Armenia and Azerbaijan, the terms under which this will be completed. Both the Lachin Corridor and the Southern transit route are specifically set out in the a November truce agreement that ended um, the Second Karabakh War. So part of it is, I think we, we need to, or I would suggest that we also look at differing uh, time frames from the parties to the conflict. That Azerbaijan understandably wants implementation of all elements of the truce agreement as quickly as possible. 
so that it can benefit from its military victory. Whereas Armenia appears to prefer a slower approach in order to give adequate time for adjustments to the new reality and um, for the people, not only in Nagorno-Karabakh, but people who will be living along the corridors. So as such, to Yarvan, it seems to me, and my colleagues can correct me, uh, Azerbaijan appears to be rushing difficult issues and pressuring for concessions, while to Armenia, Baku, uh, uh, sorry, while to Baku, Armenia appears to be foot dragging in implementation of the truce agreements uh, in order perhaps to gain some new advantage. The power balance obviously changed dramatically after the second yeah, I'm sorry, we are so, very, 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 very uh, strained by time. We don't have much time. Yes. But in your opinion, again, kind of wanted to kind of uh, combine was question, who is responsible for this crisis? I want to connect to both questions. Uh, second and third. And in your opinion, do you think that it is Russia who is failing behind, uh, who is not able to implement its uh, its uh, uh, its Russia is not is not able to implement its mission, uh, pre -pre -pre his mission to be a mediator to be a peacekeeper in the region because now she is driving or it is driving by some other other interests such as using azerbaijan and uh turkey as some kind of countries that would help her to uh sell uh i don't know sell energy resources to the west right well to the first question who is responsible both parties are responsible to varying different yeah. to varying degrees because of their position and the way they've dealt with the implementation of the Laching Corridor. So yeah. which I tried to send out different timeframes, um, different incentive structures for both sides. Uh, the impatience on the part of Baku, the, the interest in slowing the process on the part of uh, Armenia. Certainly Russia is, has been traditionally a key player, the most important perhaps, in the region, and I agree with my colleagues, Russia is Russia's energies, resources, and so on are diverted to the war in Ukraine. And as according to all accounts, the peacekeepers, the Russian peacekeepers in the region, uh, are somewhat demoralized. They have not been re receiving the equipment that they and and supplies that they have been promised. The rotations haven't taken place as promised, etc. So the Russian position has diminished, which creates problems in my view for both sides in the parties to this conflict. Yes, okay. So, okay, very good. So uh, again, the question goes to uh, uh, Ahmad now. So do you think that it's, uh, who is responsible for this crisis? Is it Azerbaijan, Russia, or it's still Armenia in your, in your opinion? Or everyone, you you muted. Yes, it's automatically muted. Yeah, sorry. Uh, a few points, a few clarifications. Like the the my previous colleagues, like that they mentioned a few points. I believe that I have to make a certain clarifications. Uh, when uh, Azerbaijan side said that there is no Nagorno Karabakh, it no way refers that you know like there is a no Karabakh Armenians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It means that there is uh, no name at such Nagorno Karabakh because it's part of the uh, clearing Bolshevik heritage from the region for Azerbaijan in the region. Bolshevik inherited. Uh, because yes, because the word Nagorno Karabakh it was uh, created in 1923 by Bolsheviks by segregating Armenian densely Armenian populated mountainous areas. And then naming, uh, creating a new name for the area, and then uh, you have the problem. So, from a Azerbaijan perspective, probably like the moving away from the names created by the Bolsheviks, uh, the Bolshevization of the region uh, could be uh, quite good. So that's why when there is a saying that there is a no Nagorno Karabakh, it doesn't mean that there is a no such 
place, etc., or there is uh, the, nobody recognizes the right of the people to live there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's just part of the uh, agenda of the volatilization of the region. In the same way, manner, the Han and the Stepanakert were because the uh, the name of the place before 1923, like that. Azerbaijan prefers to use the name before Bolsheviks came here. So that's mm -hmm. the very important issue. And Azerbaijan the, trying to move away Karabakh Armenians from the, okay, and my, my, the beginning of my speech, I said that the, the launching corridor or was the one of the biggest confidence building measures between Armenia and Azerbaijan. It was Azerbaijan showing that it does not want those people to leave. It creates opportunity for those people to stay there. So it's like a there is a no doubt that Lachin corridor that it is uh, like a, it is a fully Azerbaijani uh, populated area. And uh, Azerbaijan, like the uh, it's the element of the corridor is like that to show that you are you have a, some certain goodwill toward Karabakh Armenians. And we should not forget that the Azerbaijan stopping military campaign on uh, the night from 9th to 10th November. That yeah, has so some... Uh, is the Chin corridor somehow uh, related to the issues of Zangezur corridor? Is Ali trying to well, link the two issues to, to the role no, of the I, I, I don't see, I don't see, not, not anymore. Again, what, uh, so Azerbaijan has one principle also that what we are offering today, we're not going to offer tomorrow. Azerbaijan has a, this strict principle. So it was, I don't think that it's going to be offered anymore. It was, it used to, again, like the, uh, the, the first day when the great stand on Lachin Road took place, I don't know what the, whatever name we are going to figure out for this issue, when the great stand for, uh, on the Lachin Road took place, the very first demand, again, was that the protesters, they demanded General Volkov. And the demands that we see today, the complete, so the process transformed itself in a way that we don't recognize it from the very first day. So that is why those demands that Lachin Corridor equal to the Zengazur Corridor, I don't think that that's on the table anymore. So again, Azerbaijan has this principle that what we are offering today, we're not going to offer today, uh, tomorrow. And the same thing about the stats of the uh, Karabakh Armenians, et cetera, et cetera. So that is, uh, um, uh, that's actually, by the way, that's, uh, that is, uh, that's something that Azerbaijan has inherited from Levanter Patricia. He, in his famous article, said that what's being offered today will not be offered tomorrow. So that okay. was a catchy phrase, and Azerbaijan using that right now, frankly speaking, in the the internal today. discussions. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes. Very, very strange. We have so, to go to the entry level. So very soon we'll okay, have to, sorry. We have to open the floor to the, to the question. We have, will have to give opportunity to people in the room to ask this question, to ask questions. Okay, Alexander, in, in your opinion, the same. Is this Russia falling behind, fulfill its mission, or is it uh, because she's driving by some other motives? Or and again, who is responsible for all this uh, crisis? Alexander, you. Uh, I, can't... I, I wouldn't yeah. say. I wouldn't answer. Who is responsible? Situation is responsible. After the second war is responsible, after the uh, second Karabakh war, uh, balance was changed in, yeah. in this part of the world. Uh, Armenians changed with Azerbaijanis. Right. Uh, Azerb the war uh, didn't finish full. Azerbaijanis are not fully happy with this situation. Because still they can say Karabakh is not exist, Nagorno or not Nagorno or whatever. But uh, uh, in reality, you have territory which is uh, approximately about 4% of territory of internationally recognized Azerbaijani territory. So 3.9. And there you have population. And this population speaks different language, have different passports, different currency, uh, different, I don't know, constitution. They elected, uh, they elected their uh, authorities, elites, they have their constitution, etc., etc., etc. So this is in reality, de facto, this is not part of Azerbaijan. De facto, not the uh, jury. Mm. Uh, Azerbaijan try to do something with that. It's not, yes, sure, we have this uh, famous war on names, 
here Nagorno is Bolshevik, Karabakh is not Bolshevik, Artsakh is Armenian, so it's not good. Uh, Karabakh economic region is wider than Karabakh. All this saying to population of Karabakh that you guys are not exist. At least their uh, understanding is like that, because when they say that you can live there, and if you are not uh, or I don't know, crime, etc. Uh, so you, you can stay there and live there. But on the territory which was occupied by Azerbaijani forces, I mean, uh, in time of Second Karabakh War, uh, there were about 38,000 uh, people living there, Armenian ethnic. They are not there. Ah, you mean 38,000 dead? 38,000 people lived at the territory of Hadrut, Lachid, etc. Ah, okay, yes, that's so really they are not there. So nobody by, believes no, to that. Control of Azerbaijan, yes, I understand. Yeah, territories which are under the control of Azerbaijan, so of, of uh, official Baku. So uh, it is about people surviving there. Yeah. And uh, this is, uh, this situation is like that with Russia. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, technically speaking, you have about 2,000 peacekeepers, yes. 1,960, 1, mm -hmm. and they are surrounded by from forty to 50,000 Azerbaijani soldiers, Azerbaijani yes. army, and they have just Kalashnikovs, right. and the Azerbaijani army have everything. Yes. Uh, from aircrafts to, I, I don't know, Bayraktar's uh, tanks yes. and everything. So technically, even if you will, uh, if with uh, Russian uh, bodyguards, with even uh, Russian uh, base in Armenia itself, in Gubri, it's not serious. Yeah. But uh, peacekeeping is not about weapon. Peacekeeping is about flak. You have flag of Russian Federation, which is yes. power, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and and uh, uh, big power, big country. But nobody believes that Russia will open second front or will, and, and will come to Azerbaijan from the north. It's not serious. So yes. this is not technical uh, or security uh, problem. This is a problem of Russian abilities, Russian capacities to continue do what they do. Situation changed after the beginning of Ukraine war. Absolutely. Azerbaijanis, they try to, Azerbaijanis, I mean, sorry, uh, official Baku, they try to push and check the red lines. And these red lines is not, uh, are not red lines of Armenians just. Mm. This is red lines of Russians. Can we do this? Can we do that? What Russians are going to do? How are they going to answer? What will be a pressure from outside? What kind of instrument they will use, etc. So they do uh, this uh, because Russians, uh, situation in Russia, in Russia itself, in Moscow, yes, changed the Ukrainian war. Yes. Well, that's yes. what's yes. going on. It, it's not about, I'm not, uh, wish to blame this or that side. The situation is like that because of uh, situation is like that. Absolutely. Ukraine, yeah. With Russia, because of Russian aggression to Ukraine. Okay, you know, I think we should open the floor to the discussion. The couple of more questions which I wanted to ask everyone. But uh, let's go. Yes, the one of this person in the in the room wanted to ask a question. Uh, uh, Alexander and Ahmad, your overall attitude in Azerbaijan and Armenia, Yerevan, on the situation, how much an average citizen is concerned about, about this or cares is what is happening in Lachin overall? The people, average, average person in Armenia and Azerbaijan, in your opinion, how much average person is concerned about what is going on in this area? Okay. Well, listen, the, the, the whole region is in, in, in flames. What about yeah. the Azerbaijan embassy in Iran? 
uh, what's happening around the Azerbaijan? We feel like a frog in that water. When you like to boil the water gradually, frog doesn't feel and it dies. So I believe that Armenian and Azerbaijan are those frogs in the in the water. For the mm -hmm. last two years, the situation became gradually so uh, so boiled that we do not notice the, how the things around us getting hot. The average person, like uh, the, the, the one of the events happening in, in one week or two weeks, that would not happen in Azerbaijan before 2015 for a, 10, uh, for a decade. You know, Azerbaijan was famous for the uh, labeling its the, uh, situation existing as unstable, that nothing happens, everything is perfect. Before 2015, like the Azerbaijan embassy getting attacked, it was something uh, like the, far, far, far away. Uh -huh. But for the last two years, we had five embassy attacks. Five embassy attacks in the, 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 the last one with the fatal. So that is why like uh, the Azer average Azerbaijan person sees that something, something big, really big is happening and it's very concerned. I believe that I am not the, like the, in the past, uh, if you are a researcher on the topic, on the regional security, you should be aware of everything. These days, I'm not. I, I'm, I'm telling it frankly, because so many friends and the ordinary people reading the news before that I do. For example, I'm here like the talking to you over Zoom, but something happened there. Like that should, soon I, I'm going to get a lot of WhatsApp messages that what's happening. So there are other people of like the like the, the people they are interested on the going development in a in a manner that they were not interested before 2020. So that's why average people feels that the region is in flames. The what's happening in Russia, what's happening in Iran, what's happening in Iran Azerbaijan relations, what's happening in Russia Azerbaijan relations. It's big. It's huge. So, and frankly speaking, right now, Armenia Azerbaijan relations, I don't believe that this is a priority for Azerbaijan foreign policy anymore. It's just uh, like there was this topic that why Azerbaijan pushing the issues. I I was telling it like that last year and that this year, Azerbaijan sees that, that developments happening around the region and that we are going to face tsunamis soon. And average people, they feel that also. If at the expert level, uh, uh, and uh, or the other level, you are more, much more informed. You have capacity to analyze certain stuff. At average person level, uh, you you don't have that much expertise, but you are exposed to so much news that you feel that there is a something being going on. So that is why this is a what's happening is a big news in Azerbaijan, and mm -hmm. uh, ordinary people so many questions. So that's why like the Azerbaijan, the foreign policy right now is like the how to finish everything with Armenia fast, and then move on and the probably make Armenia an ally and the work together against the developments taking place in a bigger region. So sorry if it's long. Thank you. No, no, that's fine. Okay, Alexander, in your opinion, how much average person in uh, Armenia and Karabakh is concerned uh, with what is going on, the uh, ordinary person? Uh, we don't have sociology of that. Yes. Uh, but uh, uh, still, sociology, which, which I would uh, believe. Uh, sure, for uh, Armenia or for Armenians, even the uh, problem of Karabakh is the central uh, problem now and more important problem now. And you see. And is it as, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. Is it as important as it was at the end of 1980s? Oh, it's not as important as it used at to be. the end of 1980s. It's different because, yeah, yeah, I just did. In beginning of Karabakh movement, etc. Yeah. Uh, it's so different. That time you had hopes. Uh, this, uh, at that time, in beginning of the process, you had, we will talk too much about that first. A part of the, this movement was trying to change the situation inside Soviet Union, then it was war, and then to, to, uh, 26 years, Armenia uh, lived after the first uh, Karabakh war, uh, and the situation was different. Now, I would say sometimes, you know, even, even inside Armenia, analysts say about new status quo. I wouldn't say that this is new status quo. I would call it uh, anomia. Old status quo died. 
new status quo we still don't have. Nobody understands what is going to be tomorrow. Nobody understands how we're going to go out from this situation. Sometimes from some part of society, there's have hopes connected with Russia, but it's less and less. In some parts of society, you have hopes connected with, uh, with the West. Yeah, exactly. Uh, nobody is uh, happy with that. Uh, it's so clear that situation is very risky. Uh, you're waiting uh, new war. It's not about is it possible or not or not in reality, but at least in, in uh, uh, social good is like that. So the uh, uh, situation is, is not very, very easy. Uh, in not so, that easy. Yeah. And plus all that, you have war in Ukraine, you have instability in uh, Iran, you have uh, problems in, in the Middle East, which is close to our borders. You have uh, Turkey with problems there. Uh, political problems, I mean, elections, et cetera, et cetera. You have discourses coming from here and there. When you look from Yerevan, when you look from Yerevan, situation is not uh, like, you know, not geographically, politically. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like you have Baku from, uh, from the east and Ankara from the west. You have two Bakus. Oh, yeah. Uh, because what uh, what Turks want from us uh, is not their demand. It's Azerbaijani demand. They they say do what Ali have said and everything will be uh, okay. So uh, the situation is quite quite uh, not stable. I would say uh, if you ask me about uh, about people. Of yes, and I, I don't ask. And, and can you do you want to come comment on this? Do you, do you have any ideas about this? How do you think people in uh, this two South Caucasian republics are concerned about this situation? Do, 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 um, do you just have... from what I, I'm not in the region, so just from what I've read, I think there was a surprise that the response in Armenia to the blockade has been at least based on what I've read, has been surprisingly muted. Mm -hmm. uh, that Prime Minister Pashinyan himself has said that Armenia is not going to decide the fate of the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh. That is something for the Armenians to do themselves. And just to the other point, I fully agree. I think the situation is responsible for these specific challenges like the Lachin Corridor, like the Zangazur Corridor and other things. Uh, and that lead, that goes back to this security dilemma. But coming back to the point of Russia, I think we, keep in mind, we should keep in mind that perception of power and influence is often as important as the objective measure of power and influence. And Russia's declining power and influence, and I would just add we haven't asked about the US, but the US primary objective in the South Caucasus has been even before the Second Karabakh War, not only, but primarily to limit Russian influence in the region. So perception of power and influence is extremely important. And it, based on what our colleagues have said, I think that is playing an important role um, in the uncertainty you've described the over, both in Baku and in Yerevan, an overriding uncertainty, which leads to insecurity on both sides. And it's it's a global phenomenon. The post We still talk about the post-Cold War era because we don't have a new framework. Um, so I, I, those are just a couple of points that I would add yeah, to the conversation. Yeah. Uh, another very specific question asked by Narek Safaran. Uh, what do you think about the role of, uh, yes, I guess it was Nareg, if I'm not, uh, no, I don't know. Uh, no, I guess it's not, well, I don't know if it, I don't, don't quite understand when I look at this feat. What do you think about the role of Vardan, uh, what, was the, what is his name? Uh, Ruben, Ruben Vardanian. Yes, Ruben Vardanian. 
So, I mean, there is a lot of concern in Azerbaijan. They called him Russian spy, Russian agent. They called him just get let him get out of the of the region and everything would be fine. And actually, I saw his interview to BBC. I don't remember how is it called, Hard Talk or something like that. Uh, when this guy, even the journalist, famous British journalist, he was sitting in front of him and he said something uh, which like next day it made many Armenian uh, Facebook bloggers, YouTube, everybody very upset. He told him, you have two options. Either you would reach some agreement with Azerbaijan or you have, to, you have all get out of that. And that infuriated, infuriated a lot of them. Uh, no, so what do you think about his role and what do you think about him and his role in this uh, development? Well, they're decisive. I would say that Baku would be much more tolerant to the development taking place in, 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 in Karabakh if there was Northern Valenia. Once he appeared, it was a strong message to Baku that, okay, Baku allowed uh, Russia to get in and they have a temporary military control over the region. But now Russia sends its own guy as a leader of the community, as a leader of the region. And that the guy is going to exploit the economic resources of the region. So for Baku, it immediately was that Ruben Vardanya and the Moscow decided to have military control over the region, political control over the region, and the economic control over the region. So once Ruben Vardanya appeared at the end, they started using these economic resources, exploiting the, the mines uh, in, the, in the region. It made uh, Karabakh no different from Abkhazia, Ossetia, Crimea, Donetsk, Lugansk, and etc. So because again, you have all levels of Russian control. But there. Crimea was uh, simply the next, and uh, Donetsk. What, what do you mean? Crimea, Crimea was okay. simply <laughs> part of yes. Russia. Officially. Yes. So, so no, I'm trying like the areas, gray areas, where the, the Russia has the multi-layer control. So Azerbaijan. From Azerbaijan perspective, um, the Russian troops, uh, they have no mandate in the region. The, the, only, the only reason why they're called peacekeepers is because President Aliyev keeps calling them peacekeepers. The day he stops calling them peacekeepers, they become soft occupational force. Mm -hmm. And then now, once Ben Vardanian entered the game, it was Moscow making sure that there is a neutral in the game. But to extend, it is uh, to solidify its uh, military uh, presence in the region. Military component is there, political component is there, and the economic component is there. So Moscow decided to act. And by going to back to uh, to the issue to what uh, the, the was raised by Anne, that there is a quite a surprising uh, low key response from Yerevan on this issue. We would see that other players are much more active, or the people would expect that Yerevan would be much more active. And the, frankly speaking, a few months, if there was a, some information that uh, during this time, Baku and Yerevan, they worked together to get rid of Ruben Vardanian, I would not be surprised. So I believe that it's best interest of the both Baku and Yerevan to make sure that uh, this Russian influence in the region, that and in Armenia, there is a, there are opinions that Ruben Vardanian might jump to Yerevan and uh, might be, um, and, uh, su might succeed um, uh, and Prime Minister Pashinyan. So in that context... Yerevan, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, I said Yerevan. Uh, Ruben Vardanian might, might succeed Pashinyan, that's what you said? I'm yes, there is, there are, there are, in Armenian media there are talks like that. Um, so that is why I believe that in this context, uh, Yerevan's that low-key response to the issues uh, and that it shows that there is a much more things going on between Baku and Yerevan than we can notice at the first sight. I would say that uh, if you review that, uh, it was a quite a quite a good coincidence when, in the early January, President Ali and the Prime Minister Pashinyan they decided to hold a press conference on the same day, and they basically in a very similar manner. And the and the President Ali was very restrained, and he he uh, brought attention to the fact that. He doesn't want to use some words that in Armenia, they, it can be accepted as, uh, let's say, as, a, uh, as pressure. That he mentioned it the, the, uh, like clearly. He mentioned that he's not using uh, the words that in Armenia they might see it as a pressure. And also, I would say that 
uh, Baku not reacting or not talking about why Armenia and Azerbaijan did not sign a peace deal by the 31st December. It's excellent sign that there is a, some pops or something uh, going on below the radars. And I believe that Ruben Vardanian played a key role in bringing Baku and uh, Yerevan together. So Ruben Vardanian's appearance in Karabakh was decisive on, on so many layers. Thank you. Okay, yes, Alexander, and what do you think about Ruben Vardanian? How do you see him? How do you see I, I'm not the greatest supporters of such kind of personification of political affairs. I don't think that Ruben Vartanian is the reason of the, of all this. Uh, Ruben Vartanian or, or rhetorics about Ruben Vartanian as a I don't know, spy was sent from Russia is a rhetoric, like rhetoric about uh, ecologists at the border. Uh, Ruben Vartanian, you know, Armenians have diaspora, and a lot of officials of Republic in Republic of Armenia, they were from different countries originally, by origin. By the way, Ruben Vartanian was, bo was born in, in Armenia, not in Russia. Uh, you know, uh, before Ruben Vartanian, in time now and after Ruben Vartanian, I think, Azerbaijan is not recognized Nagorno-Karabakh Republic and their officials. Ruben Vartanian is a state minister. It's uh, like prime minister in, uh, uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh. He's Minister, uh, state minister of Nagorno Karabakh Republic. Azerbaijan does not recognize such subject as Nagorno Karabakh Republic. If tomorrow the state minister of Nagorno Karabakh Republic will be not Ruben Vartanian, but Vartan Rubenian or somebody else, what is going to change? Did they recognize previous? State Minister of the Karabakh. Do you know his his name? Yeah. So it it is not about Ruben Vartanian. Russia doesn't need Ruben Vartanian to impact on Nagorno Karabakh. You don't have need for that. The physical security of Nagorno Karabakh population now guaranteed by Russian peacekeepers. They have a lot of. Uh, instruments to impact on Nagorno-Karabakh politics and they don't need any Ruben Vartanian for that. So I don't need that. Uh, it is serious to talk so personified about person which can change all Azerbaijan perception on Nagorno-Karabakh because he came from Moscow. No, uh, I wouldn't say that it is, it's a case. So uh, the problem is not uh, not in Ruben Vartanian. Not Ruben Vartanian. Vartanian. You have, if, if, even theoretically, you want to talk to you, I mean, official Baku, to population of Nagorno Karabakh, and you don't recognize Republic of Nagorno Karabakh, you would like to talk with uh, people who were elected there. Yeah. You don't, that's you wouldn't that's talk to that's people, etc. And that's maybe she has, she can, maybe Anne can, I, I, I can tell us if you have any thoughts about Ruben Vardanyan. Um, just a brief, actually more of a question. And as I see it, uh, I know uh, he, he has gotten a lot, him. oh, he's gotten a lot of attention. Uh, yes. and, but to me, the key question is, so is there a competition within Nagorno-Karabakh to be the spokesperson for Nagorno-Karabakh in what I understand are discussions going on with leadership in Baku. Uh, and the more that, the, if indeed the people in Nagorno-Karabakh are uh, confronted with this competition for leadership and to be the spokesperson, the impact on their ability to have substantive discussions with Baku over the status, not status, status, I understand that's off the table, but the conditions uh, under which the remaining Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh 
will be have their security, etc. Okay, thank you. Now the question is: now I want to ask something, uh, Ahmad, Is it uh, this question with status? Is it closed completely? You think? Okay, a few words about that, uh, Ruben Vardanian. I, uh, uh, we know uh, like uh, Alexander Chetov for, uh, for some time, and that uh, I understand that, that his comments on the issue also. But I also, like, uh, he talked about the, the flag effect. So sometimes a person, it's not just a person, it's just a flag effect is there. So Ruben Vardanian is the modern flag effect. In, in there. So he talked about the flag effect. I believe that we, we can refer it to the Republican Party. And also, um, Azerbaijan was talking to Vitaly Balasanya. Uh, so before Ruben Party came in. So you may, if you say that, look, Azerbaijan doesn't want, didn't want to talk, it, but you had to talk to someone. And uh, Ruben Party appearance there was a good cause for to stop all the talks. I'm going to agree with you. But uh, frankly speaking, like the Azerbaijan was not talking to any uh, Karabakh Armenians. Uh, I don't think so. Like the, there were quite a many, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of issues. You, is it the issue of status completely out of the uh, of the table now? You think? Uh, for Azerbaijan, yes. As I mentioned, that the principle that what we are offering, like the Azerbaijan principle, that what Azerbaijan offers today will not offer tomorrow. That is there, and I believe that it's a chain reaction. Once you granted some special status for. Karabakh Armenians within Azerbaijan, in a few years, you have to grant it to the other ethnic minorities, especially there are a lot of Georgians living in Azerbaijan. So once you granted yeah. that status to the Georgians in Azerbaijan, you have to grant that status to Azerbaijanis living in Georgia and then to Armenians living in Georgia. So then you launch a, the topic for negotiations. Then a, to you launch a completely other stuff. So that is why, like, a, if before 2020 war, there was no, a question, large... question would be the French Senate uh, voted to recognize Karabakh. Does there is any fear in Azerbaijan that under pressure, uh, is, as a result of this blockade, French president can simply sign this order in action? You know, all, all, all he has to do is just to sign some paper on the table. Uh, I would That's say that... Okay. For me. It will be very sad because I don't think that the creation of new states on the map of the world would not be a very good idea, I think, think personally. Uh, but my question is, is there any fear in, are there any fears in Azerbaijan? He might have this other uh, decision made by the French parliament. He can just sign it, and that's it. Who can prevent him? No, uh, several reasons. Because right now, because of the war in Ukraine, the principle of the territorial integrity principle is the, let's say, is um, is the most important principle, let's say, in the international politics, especially for the yeah, Western but players. So that's of course already. Let me say that we, we, so, we will do this case, and that will be the last one. We will uh, we will recognize state <laughs> of XXB, but we will never recognize his case. Well, of no, B that B was uh, so. That was I, I forget to say that there is a Kosovo is exception. There will be a lot of exceptions, right? So once you do that, Not and especially lot. when the war in Ukraine. There might be some others. Okay, we will so look, XBC, but not BXC. So that is, uh, look, uh, that is the no, same. Like my the... question was different. My question was, are there any fears in Baku today? Because no. of the no. pressure. The, the second reason. Thank you. you know, I think we have just one minute left. I want to thank you, everyone. And I want to apologize to those whose questions I could not ask. Uh, I have a lot of them on the list and my chat chat box. I believe we are out of time, right? It's uh, 11.59 and uh, I think it's just time to end. Uh, okay, I guess I should thank every, everybody who was in the room, all participants. Uh, again, there, unfortunately, it's 12 o'clock already, 12 p.m. We should finish over here. And thank you so much. Thank and you for being here. Thank, thank you. you. And again, we learned that one hour is not enough. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.